Hi, my name is Megan McAllister. We dairy farm in northeast Iowa in Dubuque County near New Vienna. Um, I farm with my husband Ted and his family. We are, he's actually a seventh generation farmer and I'm a sixth generation farmer um, and we raise dairy cows. So we milk about 260 to 270 cows on our farm every day, twice a day. Um, and this is our milking parlor. So this is where most of the work kind of happens every day. We milk um, at 4 and 4, so 4 a.m. and 4 p.m. So that means this morning we were up at 3 30 in the morning so uh, it gets to be a lot of short nights but we do enjoy what we do um, this parlor um, the style that it is this is called a double 12 parallel so double 12 because there are 12 milking units on each side of the parlor um, so that means that we could be milking 24 cows at a time and parallel because as the cows walk in they exit from the back where the overhead garage doors are they walk straight into the parlor and then they make a 90 degree turn in order to be in their milking stall so that then their back end is facing us down here in the parlor. So after we prep, we first we, we prep the cow. It's important that that's part of the milking process. So our dip is all in these drop down hoses. Um, so this is a disinfectant for the teats and we just simply spray it right on the cow. I don't know if you can see that better, but is that good? good? Nice and close? Okay, so you spray it, um, disinfects the cow, gets the teats nice and clean. We then force strip the cow. We take a couple squirts of milk out of each teat, make sure that she is thoroughly prepped and ready to go. We then take a towel and wipe each cow. Um, again, making sure everything is clean and everything is ready to go. Um, that also is promoting the cow to let her milk down. It's very important that while they're in the milking parlor that they are very calm and they are str it's a stress-free environment because if they are um, if they are feeling any sort of anxiety or stress or releasing any sort of adrenaline it'll actually block the let the milk letdown hormone hormone oxytocin so um, it's very important that they have a very calm and enjoyable experience in the parlor so after they're fully prepped um, we just put on the milking unit um, and it's pretty simple. So each cow has four quarters, four teats. So each one of these will connect to a teat. Um, not right now, clearly, because we're not milking, but um, then it'll, the milking unit will come off automatically when the cow is done milking. It's all based on flow. So we don't have to be monitoring the exact second when she's done, that milker will pop off all by itself. And then we post dip spray again with the same spray that's in our drop down hoses. Um, right now, all the milking units are hooked up like this because after every milking, all of the equipment gets washed and sanitized. So all of these units are hooked up to these trays, which will automatically clean um, with a detergent and with an acid and sanitizer as well. So everything is always clean, clean, clean um, after every milking and is recent sanitized again before our next milking. So, okay. So our milking parlor is what's known as a rapid exit. Um, so when all the cows are done, we press the button, it's all com controlled with an air compressor. So it's all air. Um, the entire exit, this entire bar will lift up at one time and all 12 cows can come out at one time. Um, rapid exit versus other types of parlors, um, their fronts might open like a gate kind of, um, and then you have to wait for all those cows to get out of the way before it could come back down. With this, literally once the last cow's booty is out of the way, it can come right back down and they can just chill out in this area for a little bit. So it keeps milking moving along a little bit faster. This is our freestall barn. So this is where the cows live every single day. This is our entire milking herd in this barn. Um, what you see coming down now is what's called a Juno. So it's an automatic feed pusher. Um, so the cows are fed every morning and this is what they're going to eat for the entire day. So by tomorrow morning, all this feed will be cleaned up. But as cows eat, they tend to push that feed away from them. So it's important that we push up their feed throughout the day so that they can reach their feed and plus it promotes them to come up and eat more. Um, every time that feed is pushed up, you can see it's getting closer to them. Every time that feed is pushed up, it actually, they 
in their mind, it's like fresh feed all over again. So they are encouraged to come up and eat. Um, you didn't see it, but I saw it as we were standing here. All these cows came up to see us because they hear the Juno, they know it's coming, um, and they're going to take advantage of some of that feed getting pushed up and that fresh feed. So this Juno will run um, about every hour throughout the day after we get done feeding. So from about 9 or 10 o'clock um, in the morning until all the way overnight until about 3, 3.30 in the morning, this Juno will run every hour. So again, just promotes these cows to come up and eat. And that's a good thing. So these cows have an all-you-can-eat buffet within this barn. So they can come up at any time that they want reach their head through a headlock and grab some feed. So these headlocks, they might look a little intimidating, but they're never locked unless we're actually working with the cows. So you can see they're free to reach their heads in and can back up as they wish to. I mean, Dairy Queen might not because she likes to be pet, but they can freely come in and out of these locks. Um, only when we're working with the cows, if we have herd health, if we have our veterinarian out, um, or any of those things, or if we're breeding a cow, only then do we actually lock the locks. Otherwise, they're always unlocked and cows are free to come in and leave whenever they want. Um, other things of this barn, this is actually what's called a tunnel ventilated barn. Um, so in that sense, it actually stays cooler in the summer and stays warmer in the winter. Um, of course, we aren't heating the barn. That would be very expensive, but cows generate a lot of body heat. Um, they actually have uh, one stomach with four different compartments. One of those compartments is what's called the rumen, and the rumen is like their own onboard furnace. So as they are digesting and processing their feed, that rumen is creating a lot of heat. Um, so it's keeping the cow warm, and then she's also throwing off a lot of body heat too. So by the time you have 270 cows in this barn, they are keeping it warm just by us being able to have the curtains closed, have the fans run on thermostat so that we do still get constant fresh air exchanges. Um, the cows are able to keep the barn nice and warm and it's kind of a crummy day outside today and kind of cold and it's very comfortable in here. So that's all part of the job of the cow. So they have an all you can eat buffet, they have a temperature controlled barn for the seasons. And then they also have unlimited 24-7 access to fresh water in their pens as well. And the water is even warm, which is important to note because they actually prefer warm water and will drink more water if it's warm versus if it's cold. Yeah, you want to get close? Okay, so as far as what a cow eats, <laughs> little E, she's very hungry. Um, Cows eat a variety of things, and that can vary based on even farm to farm on feed availability. Um, so in their feed, a big part of their diet um, for us is it's a very high corn silage, high haylage diet. So the corn that you see in the field, we in the fall, we chop that entire plant, and that ends up in their feed. Um, you can see some little corn kernels in here, and then a lot of this um, kind of stemmier stuff, that's part of that corn plant. That's that fiber from that corn plant. Um, so corn silage, haylage, so when you sn think about when you're driving with your windows down in the summer and somebody just cuts some hay, cuts some alfalfa, and you take that big whiff and you're like, oh gosh, that smells so good, that should be a candle. That's that haylage. So instead of us like drying and baling that hay, when we cut it, we are storing it in a bag and storing it more like a corn silage so that it ferments. Um, other things that they eat, we do have a protein mineral mix in here. Um, we do have um, a soybean meal. We do have some chopped hay. And then um, in the dry cow ration and our heifers, here's a kernel of corn for that corn silage. Um, in our heifer diet and our dry cows, they'll actually get some straw as well because those cows don't need the high energy diet that a lactating cow does. We kind of say like a lactating cow gets this endless all you can eat buffet of everything she wants from like the meat and mashed potatoes and all the goodies. Whereas a dry cow or a non-lactating animal, a heifer, they don't need all those goodies and all those groceries because they aren't really working that hard. So they eat more of a slim down diet. They get more of a straw, less energy diet. 
So we talked about the feed, we talked about what cows eat. Um, now let's talk about where they really live within the barn. Um, cow comfort is really priority number one. Um, you can't make milk if, you, if your cows aren't happy and if they aren't comfortable. So those are two things that we really have to accomplish in the barn. And one thing that makes cows really happy is using a cow brush. Of course, Baker got distracted by us and stopped using the brush, but I'm sure someone will use it while we're standing here. Um, then in general, you'll just see all the cows laying and they're laying comfortably in their stalls. And they're all resting on beds of sand. So think about the cows like laying on the beach all day long and just chilling. So sand is really good because it's a inorganic bedding source so it doesn't allow for like bacteria to grow. So it's good for um, milk quality, good for their udder health. And then it is also extremely comfortable. Um, when they, I mean, cows are big animals, right? So like Holsteins, these are two-year-old cows. So these ones aren't done growing yet, these Holsteins. Um, but they'll range from 1,200 to 1,500 pounds um, or a little more if they're a really big, old, mature cow. Um, a Jersey will weigh around 900 to 1,000 pounds. So that's a lot of weight that when they lay in their stall, they first are going down on their knees and then plopping their rear end down. And so that surface that they lay on has to be comfortable for them. Um, what else? You'll, all of our cows, we, um, we do monitor their health very closely. You'll actually see all of them are wearing tags in their ears, these blue and white tags. Where'd my prop go? There it is, these tags, okay? So this tag is like her own Fitbit. So this tag will monitor her health, her rumination, her activity, um, and we can look her up anytime. <laughs> you got a friend there. <laughs> anytime, um, and we can see her on our smartphones or on our computer, and we will know um, how she is doing health-wise, and we'll get flagged and we'll get reports if someone all of a sudden isn't doing well. Um, so that's kind of all part of our job in caring for these animals. Yes. So this is what cows do all day long. They will spend about 14 hours a day just laying down and resting. Um, so when you walk in a barn, you want it to be quiet. Like if I wasn't talking, you just hear nothing. Um, and that's kind of the goal of barns. You hear little squeaks of the cow brush or little squeaks of the headlocks, but otherwise you, you really don't want to walk into a noisy barn. Um, you want quiet, content, um, happy cows. And that's that's the cows that make the best milk. Do you want to talk about the difference between your black and white cows? Yeah, and white cows? great, great point. So um, we do have a mixed herd here. When I joined um, Ted's farm before we got married, I brought all these little brown cows with me. Um, they're my favorite breed. These brown ones are called Jerseys. The black and white ones are called Holsteins. Um, and there is a dramatic size difference here. Look at this one using the brush. So like I said about their weight before, um, Holsteins will be like 1,200 to 1,200 to 1,500 pounds, whereas Jerseys will be um, closer to that 900 pounds. Um, so you do see like between Serta and 1,252 here. That's a big size difference. Um, and Serta is actually an older cow than what 1,252 is, but Jerseys are a more moderate sized cow. Um, so they're going to be a smaller framed individual. Um, and they're also going to make less milk, which you think, oh gosh, why would we make a cow that, why would we want a cow that makes less milk? Well, jerseys are naturally higher in fat and higher in protein. So their milk is actually more sought after for further processing of dairy products, like your cheese and your butter and your ice cream and all those good things. Um, Holsteins will produce a higher volume of milk, but will be lower in the fat and lower in the protein. Um, so they're great for of just strictly fluid milk. So like I said, we have a mixed herd. So actually the milk from all of our cows does go together in one bulk tank. And then that milk is goes right to Dubuque. So not very far from us, just a 20 mile drive or so and gets processed right in Dubuque, Iowa. Um, most of that goes into fluid milk, even though we have a mixed herd and we get that benefit of the higher fat and the higher protein. Um, that plant that it goes to still goes into fluid milk. So 
Okay, so now we're standing in our calf barn. Um, so after calves are born, it's important that we care for that animal. Dairy cows really aren't necessarily the best of mamas. Um, while they might lick a calf off, they don't encourage it to nurse and to suckle, and calves have to have colostrum, which is the first milk that comes from the cow after she's had a calf. So we do collect that colostrum, um, and we do test it. It needs to be high enough quality, um, and it, that calf is going to get two feedings of that colostrum. But this is the barn they come into after they're born, um, and everybody is raised in these individual stalls. Um, this barn holds about 56 of these individual stalls, and we've already been maxing it out, which is crazy. We just built it last winter. Um, but calves will stay in these individual stalls for about nine weeks of age, so not very long um, in the grand scheme of things. But this is really so that they have time to build their immune system. When they are first born, they don't have any sort of protection against any germs or bacteria. That really has to come from the colostrum that they get, um, those antibodies from that milk. And so they're very susceptible to any sort of disease or illness um, or respiratory issues when they're at this, this age and this size. So it's important that we are able to monitor their individual health and these stalls and that raising them individually for the time being really helps with that. After nine weeks of age, they actually will move to the other half of the barn and will be in group housing. So they do get into a group housing situation after this. Um, what else? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, so when the calves are first born, um, they each get ear tagged with this little yellow button. You can come closer. But like we saw the cows in the barn had all had great big yellow tags, right? Well, those tags are specific to each animal. Um, so it takes a little bit for those tags to get printed specifically to that cow and to arrive. Um, so we tag them initially with this little yellow button so that we can keep track of who is who. Um, and then this is just more my visual reference for when I'm feeding calves that it's my number so that I don't have to be trying to read their tag because they're sucking on me and bucking me and everything. So it's, it's who they are, 1695, and then she was born on January 6th. Um, and then, of course, 1696, her name is Spice Girl, um, born on January 8th. So it's just my visual so that as these calves get older, I know when they're getting close to that nine-week age, and I can start weaning them or taking them off of milk. Um, so you'll notice some of these calves have bottle racks. Um, some further down the line do not. Um, after they are about two weeks of age, we work on transitioning them to drinking their milk out of a bucket versus drinking their milk out of a bottle. Um, and that allows them to just consume more fluids the older that they get so that they can get more calories and more nutrition to suit their growing body and their growing needs. Um, so they'll have, as they get older, they'll have a milk bucket, uh, well, which will have water in it throughout the day so that they can always have access to hydrate and to have fluids. And then they also get a grain mix as well. Um, this is their starter mix. So it does have a variety of things in there. Um, it, they are coated in molasses essentially, so it is a little sweet for the calf. So it is very palatable so that they like to eat it. Um, and this is really important in developing the rest of their kind of digestive system. We talked a little bit in the barn that a cow actually has one stomach with four compartments. Well, when, a, when they're born, when they're a calf, only one of those compartments is even functional. Um, so it's important that through the right nutrition, um, we work to develop those other compartments of her stomach because she will need those as she gets older and has to eat other types of forages and other types of feed. <laughs> well, it is winter in Iowa, so much like I'm wearing a jacket today or you wear a jacket when you go outside and go out for recess, it's the same things with the calves. They need coats too because this is where they live. You know, it's not a heated building. Um, they need to be prepared uh, to keep up their body heat in cold temperatures. We put blankets on the calves because this allows them that the milk that they are consuming or the grain that they are eating, they're able to put those calories into actually growing versus 
only body maintenance to stay warm. Um, when they have a coat on, if you were able to reach your hand in between the coat and the calf, it would be like a little furnace in there, like it's very warm. Um, so she's able to maintain her body heat without having to use her calories she's eating to do that. She's able to do that because that extra layer of warmth that we provide. And it's very cute, right? When you clean, when they graduate, what do you do with their pin after they're done, after they graduate? Great question. So after they graduate from here, um, it's important that everything gets taken down, cleaned, and sanitized. So for instance, we just set these pens up behind you. We just set those up last night. Um, so these are actually ready for new calves to come in, like we just had these calves born on um, Saturday and Sunday. Um, Sharky and Emily, because we had the shark farmer out and um, recorded us for his TV show coming up. But um, look at how deep their straw bedding is. We want that so that they can really nestle into it and stay warm. Um, but these other pens, they're prepped. They got thick bedded straw. They're ready to go so that cavies can go into them. But when we wean a calf and move them to the other end of the barn, these pens will be completely broken down. So all these pins just pull out. Um, and there's a front section, there's the two long sides, and there's a back. So we take everything down, everything gets power washed and cleaned, and then the bedded pack, we come in with a skid loader and we scoop it up. So um, just a few days ago, we had great big wean calves in this whole section and had to clean up that manure pack. So it is a little bit of a process, but yeah, it, everything with just like raising newborn baby, human babies, we have to be clean, and it's the same thing for um, raising calf babies as well. So Sugar Plum is special. Her grandma was Sparkle, who was my ultimate favorite cow, um, who passed away this summer, actually. So she uh, she's extra special, and she gets extra attention and gets to run when I'm feeding calves. So now we're over here in the middle of the day, and she's like, oh, this is great. I get to run again. very spoiled. So this is our the other half of the calf barn. Yes. These are our wean calves. So they aren't very happy when they have to switch environments because change is bad. Nobody likes change, but it's necessary for them to continue to grow um, and have space to do that. And then plus you'll notice a difference in their diet. They're still, these first couple pens are still getting that same starter grain that we saw but hay starts to get introduced so that we can again continue to give them the right nutrition to develop the other parts of their stomach, the other compartments of their stomach. Yeah. So they have, again, 24 by seven access to feed. They have a bedded pack um, at the back of the pen so they can, and they have water back there and they just kind of hang out and do what they want all day long. But notice these calves don't have coats on because they are a big enough size and they're old enough and they have enough condition on them um, that they are able to maintain and regulate their own body temp. How much do you think they weigh at this, how much do they roughly weigh at this stage? Um, the ones in this first pen, they would be, oh, a little variation, but close to 200 to a little over 200 pounds. <laughs> The goal is that they double their birth weight and then some by the time that they get weaned. So if she was a 100-pound calf when she was born, she should weigh 200 pounds plus when she's weaned. Okay, so my favorite part about being a dairy farmer is this. <laughs> it's the calves, and not only when they're little, um, but being able to care for them from the moment that they're born until they are a great big productive cow. Um, I like seeing them grow throughout their entire life cycle, um, but the babies are definitely, definitely the bonus. Um, and then I would say my least favorite thing about being a dairy farmer is that it is stressful and it is challenging. Um, and it really is 24-7, 365. Um, we don't get weekends off. We don't get holidays off. Um, it's you're very dedicated and you have to be because there's animals depending on you but so it is very stressful in that sense and it's hard to ever step away from the farm um but it really is it's awesome isn't it we love it